Let me quote from Peter Russell, who has written a beautiful little book called From Science to God. And he goes back to the so-called Age of Enlightenment, 17th, 18th centuries, which saw the birth of science and its successes. He says this, Copernicus had shown that we were not the center of the universe. Astronomers had found no evidence of a heaven up in the sky. Darwin had dispelled the idea that God created the earth and all its living creatures in six days. And biologists had proved virgin birth impossible. Which story should I believe? A text whose only authority was itself and whose proclamations had little bearing on my everyday reality? Or contemporary science with its empirical approach to truth? The choice was obvious. I dropped out of conventional religion. The universe seems to work perfectly well without divine assistance. Now, we must realize that there's a substantial justification in that perspective. And if today many of us, and I deal with young people, feel likewise, it's perfectly justifiable. The problem is, and at some point, even Peter Russell, he says 30 years later, he realized how naive that viewpoint was. There was an awakening in him. And I think the real challenge is to speed up that awakening, not to block the questioning, not that rebellious spirit is exactly what we need. But we must be careful not to throw out the baby with the bath water. And that's what's happened. A while back, we talked about theosophy being free from the accretions and superstitions that are there in every religion. That's the bath water. But the essence of religion, the core of the wisdom traditions, that's the precious baby. And so that's what's happened. And to this day, religion tends to be identified with belief in the literal truths of accretions and superstition in various religious texts. And all are treated as Santa Claus myths. This is mythic religion. And not just religion. Even in mainstream education, we've thrown it all out. With reference to India, Lord Macaulay, who had a big say in how the education is there today, says, a single shelf of a good European library was worth the whole native literature of India and Arabia. And we believed it then. We still believe it. A colleague of mine the other day told me that it's strange that you know, we have such good alternative medicine in our country. And he had a problem and he consulted an Ayurvedic physician and got it cured. And he, when he submitted the bills to our institute, they said, no way. Because the rules don't permit it. You have to buy Western medicine, so-called modern medicine, to get your claims reimbursed. And that is why spirituality and morality is not there in any curriculum in India today, except in a few pockets. I have a few physicist friends who I respect a lot, brilliant physicists who are atheists and who have, quite honestly, a lot of contempt for what they call all this mumbo jumbo is all about. And I respect them because what they are really against, and they're really angry, 
is there's so much counterfeit spirituality in the world today. There's so much quackery going around. But there again, it's not an open-minded science because a scientist should accept all possibilities. And let's hope that someday some awakening will take place. Now, Plato, in the Western world also we had uh, brilliant people, Socrates, Plato. Plato was a student of Socrates. He talked about three sectors which I think are very important. The beautiful, the good and the true. The beautiful refers to the individual inner experience, the subjective experience. The good, it's not just good for me, it's good for the world, good for others, good for the universe, refers to the intersubjective domain. And the true is the objective domain, the third person domain as against the first and second person domains. And science is in that objective domain. But if you ignore the first and second person domains, as we tend to do in today's world, even a Supreme Court verdict today would rely more on objective truths, not on subjective truths, then we are seriously impairing our evolution. Because it's not just science that needs to be developed, it's also morals, it's also art. And we need a coherent development in all three sectors. Even divinity expresses itself in all three sectors. In the third person perspective, when we look at nature and we go into a trance, that's nature mysticism. It's there and you feel it and you're one with it. In conventional religion, in devotional religion, we have a second person perspective. You see the deity and you feel the divinity. That's deity mysticism. And then of course you have the witness consciousness which can see and feel everything as one. And that's the first, pers the non-dual perspective, the three faces of God. So we've come to a stage where our students have very good understanding, at least theoretically, of Newton's three laws. All our students do, otherwise they won't get through our entrance examination. But if you ask them about the Four Noble Truths or the Eightfold Path of the Buddha, they have absolutely no clue. Thomas Merton said this, and I think it's perfect. He said, of what avail is it if we can travel to the moon if we cannot cross the abyss that separates us from ourselves, this is the most important of all journeys. And without it, all the rest are useless. I want to quote George Carlin, who said this, and it's a, a brilliant uh, summary of the human condition today. He was a humorist in the US and he said this in the 1980s. The paradox of our time in history is that we have taller buildings but shorter tempers, wider freeways but narrower viewpoints. We spend more but have less. We buy more but enjoy less. We have bigger houses and smaller families. We have more conveniences but less time to enjoy them. We have more degrees but less sense. We have more knowledge but less judgment. We have more experts, including civil engineers like us, <laughs> yet more problems. We have more medicine, but less wellness. We have multiplied our possessions, but reduced our values. 
we talk too much drive too fast stay up too late get up too tired watch tv too much you can replace tv with your online activity love and pray too seldom and hate too often we've learned to make a living but not a life we've added years to life not life to years we've been all the way to the moon and back but have trouble crossing the street to meet a neighbor or rather a brother we've conquered outer space but not inner space we've done larger things but not better we've conquered the atom but not our prejudices we plan more but accomplish less we've learned to rush i think this is the key to it we've learned to rush but not to wait these are times of fast foods and slow digestion big men and small character steep profits and shallow relationships two incomes but more divorce fancier houses but broken homes more entertainment but less happiness there's something more that i liked uh, from the arbinger institute they've brought out two beautiful books one is called leadership and self deception the other is called the anatomy of peace just three quotes from them people who came together to help an organization succeed actually people who came together to help an organization succeed actually end up delighting in each other's failures and resenting each other's successes we withhold information and resources from one another try to control one another and blame one another when i'm blaming a or b or department x y z and suggesting that all our problems will be solved if only they straighten up i'm doing it because their shortcomings justify my failure to improve we are living fragmented unawakened inauthentic lives and the biggest block to evolution is our clinging to the sense of ego self einstein described this very well he says a human being is part of the whole called the universe a part limited in time and space he experiences himself his thoughts and feelings as something separated from the rest a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness this delusion is a kind of prison for us restricting us to our personal desires and to affection for a few persons nearest us our task must be to free ourselves from this prison and really the time has come when we are living in a world of crisis we are sitting nicely here enjoying the breeze but are we aware what the world is really going through now we can broadly talk of many stages of evolution but i think very simply you can talk of a pre-conventional or an egocentric stage a conventional or an ethnocentric stage or a post conventional or world centric and even beyond a cosmo centric stage the problem is and ken wilber says this beautifully he says nobody at a world centric level of moral consciousness would unleash the atom bomb but somebody at a pre conventional ego centric level would quite cheerily bomb the hell out of pretty much anybody who got in his way 
Until the modern era, this problem was limited in its means because the technologies themselves were quite limited. You can inflict only so much damage on the biosphere and on other human beings with a poisoned arrow. Now, for the first time in history, it has become possible and even likely to have a global man-made catastrophe, an atomic holocaust or an ecological suicide. And there are many more inconvenient truths, as you know, related to climate change and global warming, but also due to the possible ill effects arising from quantum level energy production, robotics, genetic engineering, nanotechnology, which are really now being unleashed on a global scale. And there have been horrible predictions that life on this planet, the days are numbered. People talk about the tipping point and some say that we've crossed the tipping point and it's difficult to predict the future. But is that why 13.7 billions of years of evolution took place? If you take yourself as, a, as the life of the planet to be snuffed out like that? What does your heart say? So this is a crisis, a worldwide crisis, and it's our responsibility and our challenge to live up to that crisis. And here I think the attitude makes a lot of difference. It's easy to go under, it's easy to feel negative, it's easy to feel pessimistic or even indifferent. It's easy to just worry about my personal salvation. But that's perhaps not what the heart wants. In our traditional wisdom, we talked of many bodies, not just the cross sthula sharira, but also the subtle sukshma sharira, and even more subtle, karana sharira, that for which this individual and those individuals have been born. There's a karanam. And until that karanam is fulfilled, life has to continue. This is my fervent belief. And there's no scientific proof, of course, for this, but my heart says to me, and the more I breathe into it, and this is inspiration, inspiration is all about breathing, Insp inspire is to breathe into that ember that is there in all of us, says, there's a lot of work to be done. And the primary work is to lift human consciousness, is to enable all of us to rise to a trans-egoic level of consciousness. And it's not just me. There's a whole network of humans around the world today who are waking up to this urgent reality. Some of them are seated here. It is our responsibility to find a way. Finding divinity in ourselves is the first step. But allowing divinity to operate through us is the next step. And for that we have to shift from a mind-centered way of living to a heart-centered way of living. We have to actually evolve into a new species. And actually, the history of civilization shows that, and the history of the universe shows that, it is only when you hit a crisis such a change is possible. So, I think times are ripening. Anything is possible, but the challenge is, do you want to be part of the problem or part of the solution? I'm running out of time, so I would like to end on a happy note, uh, I think it's an attitude, you know. Only if the fire gl is blooming in you can you light other fires. And I think it's very important that parents and teachers and ordinary people have this attitude of positivity and to work for 
universal well-being actively and silently as well. So this is a story again from a tradition, my last story if you will permit me. It's a beautiful story. It's a story about finding contentment, which is the first step. Once upon a time there was a couple, a husband and wife, elderly like you folk, who just couldn't stand each other, not like you folk. <laughs> and in those days in India, there was nothing called divorce, you know, you just have to pull along, this, no way out. And so they pulled along with each other, but one fine day when the husband could not take the nagging anymore, he just stormed out of the house and he found himself walking somewhere and his steps led him to some strange path and he found himself in front of a temple, a Vishnu temple, a dilapidated old structure, nobody around and he thought he might get some peace of mind and he went in. And there was this four-armed statue of Vishnu and lo and behold, he has a darshan. You know what darshan is? He actually is able to see the Lord right in front of his eyes and he's totally taken aback because we've been told that you have to do years of tapas uh, to, to be able to get a vision like that. But this happened out of the blue and he was not particularly religious. Maybe in his past life he would have done something. And Vishnu doesn't spend much time with him and says, you have three boons. Ask and you shall receive. So, this man blurts out, he says, help me get rid of my wife. Vishnu smiles at him and says, you can ask for anything in the universe and of all the things, is this what you want? He says, this is what I want right now, please. Vishnu says, okay, that's what you want. What about the other two boons? I am not in the frame of mind to ask for anything else. If you will permit me, please, can I ask you later? Vishnu says, Tathastu, so be it. So when he walks back to his house, he's full of curiosity and lo and behold, to his amazement, he finds his wife is out there. She's, I don't know if they had bags, so they packed her bags and she looks at him sternly and says, where were you? He says, why? What happened? He says, I'm sick and tired of you, I'm leaving. I'm going to my parents' place. Goodbye. So he pretends and says, you really want to go? <laughs> Inwardly he's happy when she says yes and she storms out. So he's in a mood to celebrate and when his friends come home, he tells them this good news. Look, finally I did it. I got rid of her. They looked at him and said, got rid of her? What about the food that we were expecting you to serve? And they start narrating her qualities, her good qualities, one after another, and he gets this sick feeling in his stomach. And the final killer was, they say, you should see our wives. Your wife is such a gracious lady compared to them. And they leave him, and he feels miserable, and in his misery he again finds himself stepping out of the house, walking around and finally he lands up in front of the same temple. And there Vishnu promptly shows up and says, your second boon? He says, yes, go ahead, ask anything in the universe. And uh, Vishnu smiles at him and says, why do you have a long face? I mean, What's the problem now? He says, I made a mistake. So what do you want now? Can I have my wife back? 
Vishnu says, really? If that's what you want, go ahead. Third boon? He says, give me one more time. Few more minutes. <laughs> and he goes, goes back. And lo and behold, when he reaches home, he finds his wife has come back with her bags and she is in tears and she prostrates in front of him. In the olden days they used to do that. <laughs> and you know, I don't know, Arya Putra and all that blah blah. And he uh, kind of lifts her up and hugs her. And when they go in, he tells her the truth. He says, do you know this happened? And they weep and cling to each other and they said, we still have one more boon. And they spent the whole night trying to figure out what to ask. And they were confused. And so they went, you know, when you're confused, you should go to well-wishers who you know, think will know better. And they visited three friends, three homes. At the end of which they got even more confused because each person gave a different piece of advice. One person said, ask for all the gold in the world. The other person says, no use if someone steals it or you die. So ask for not only infinite wealth, but ask for also health and so on and so forth. But they were confused. And then this man made up his mind and he walked resolutely to the temple. And Vishnu is there, smiling at him and says, Okay, so are you ready? Last and final boon. And this man says, Yes and no. Will you permit me to ask you one question before I officially ask you for the boon? Vishnu says, Okay, but you may not like my answer to your question. He says, I don't care. I've reached the pits of my life and it's clear to me this is providential. It's clear to me that only you can show me the way. So my question to you is very simple. What is it that I should ask of you? <laughs> That's a brilliant question. What is it that I should ask of you? And Vishnu replied, Ask that you are content with what you have. And so he asked, and so he received. And the moment he stepped outside the temple, the world looked different. For the first time in his life, he saw the leaves fluttering in the breeze. He saw dewdrops in the leaves. He heard the birds chirping. There was joy everywhere. And he, could, he felt inexplicably uplifted, you know, kind of floating around. When he reached his house, the door was opened by the most beautiful lady he had ever seen in his life his good old wife. And he felt like touching all the old furniture which looked completely different. Everything had a sense of blessedness about it. Nothing, absolutely nothing in the external world had changed. But some Thing tremendous had happened inside him. And that is the kind of transformation we need to make that leap to become the next species in this universe. I had much more material but I will stop here till we meet some other time so I end with a prayer. Asato ma sadgamaya Tamaso ma jyotir gamaya 
मृत्यु और मां अमृतम कमाया ओम शांति 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 थैंक यू